Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Morning Prayer for St. George's Anglican Church in Devon on this ninth Sunday after Pentecost. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. God's love has been poured into our hearts. We dwell in him and he in us. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. And speak of all his marvelous works. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. The Lord is our refuge and strength. O come, let us worship. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The Lord is our refuge and strength. O come, let us worship. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Psalm 105 Hear my plea of innocence, O Lord. Give heed to my cry. Listen to my prayer, which does not come from lying lips. Let my vindication come forth from your presence. Let your eyes be fixed on justice. Weigh my heart, summon me by night. Melt me down, you will find no impurity in me. I give no offense with my mouth, as others do. I have heeded the words of your lips. My footsteps hold fast to the ways of your law. In your paths my feet shall not stumble. I call upon you, O God, for you will answer me. Incline your ear to me and hear my words. Show me your marvelous loving kindness. O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand from those who rise up against them. But at my vindication I shall see your face. When I awake, I shall be satisfied, beholding your likeness. God of truth and justice, watch, watch over your people in adversity, that we may know the wonders of your love and see the glory of your presence. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accused and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is, over all, God, blessed forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Canticle 12, The Bread from Heaven You gave your people angels' food, and sent them bread from heaven, ready to eat, though they did no work, rich in delights, and suiting every taste. The food which you gave showed your sweetness toward your children. It served the desire of those who ate, was changed to the flavor each one wished that the children you love might learn, O God, 
that not by various crops are they fed, but it is your word which sustains all those who trust in you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The Gospel of Christ. May the Lord add his blessing to the words of my lips, and the meditation of each heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. In our Gospel reading this morning, we find Jesus is going off by himself. He needs to get away from people, away from the crowds, and just be alone. And the reason for this is that his cousin, the evangelist, John the Baptist, uh, has been murdered. He was murdered by the king, King Herod, because he had spoken out against Herod's illicit relationship with his brother's wife. And so because he proclaimed that this was sin and that the man needed to stop this behavior and put that woman away, he got killed. And it was actually not Herod that wanted him killed. It was the girl that he was running around with wanted him killed. So Jesus' cousin, this monumental figure, the guy who'd come and laid out the groundwork for Jesus' ministry, is dead. And Jesus just, he's in this space, he just needs to be alone. And so he leaves to just go by, by himself in a deserted place. But he wasn't alone for long, because as soon as people heard that Jesus was off by himself, they went chasing after him. So they went in great numbers from the, all the local cities. We're talking 5,000 men, plus their wives, plus their children. So there is at least 15,000 people following Jesus out in the middle of the wilderness, in, in the middle of nowhere. And after preaching and teaching them, Jesus needs to do something about their dinner. When the crowds first got there and followed Jesus, they weren't thinking about food. They were just thinking about, here's an opportunity to go and listen to him preach. Here's a time that we can take our sick people out there and maybe he'll heal them. Because that was his reputation. And Jesus sees the compassion. All he wants to do is just be alone and not have any more people taking from him. And he looks around at all these ill people and these people who need something from him. And he just begins to go and lay hands on them and pray for them and heal them. And after a great healing, and after a great a message of encouragement from Jesus, the people don't want to leave. Instead, they just keep hanging around. And the disciples are looking around, and in their way, they're having compassion on the crowd too, and on Jesus. They look at Jesus, and he's exhausted, He's worn out. He really does need to get his batteries recharged. He needs to be alone and just in prayer with his father, just kind of trying to understand the grief of the loss of, of John. And they see these crowds just wanting more and more and more from Jesus. So they just want to say to Jesus, send them away. They're all hungry. They all need to eat. Just let them go. You need your space too. But Jesus doesn't respond to them in a way like, yeah, that's a good idea, I'll send them away. Instead, they say, Jesus says to them, well, you give them something to eat. 
They don't send them to the towns to get something to eat. You feed them. I'm sure the disciples were not expecting this for two reasons. One, it was impossible to feed 15,000 people. We're talking a small modern city, like a little one, that they're all around there with 12 guys and a Jesus going to feed them. Like that doesn't add up. Even if they had their bags full of food, they would not be able to feed this huge crowd of people. And so when Jesus says to them, don't send them to the towns, you feed them. There's some wisdom in this in a number of ways. One of them is the people would be exhausted even on the way to town getting to eat. He doesn't want them fainting on the way. And on top of that, what's it going to mean for all these little villages to have at least 15,000 people descend on villages of a few hundred people devouring all the food? They would be like a plague coming into town. And that doesn't look good for Jesus either if people come in and say, you know, we were all talking to Jesus and listening to him and he was doing healings and now he's like, his followers are eating all the food in town. Like that does not look good. So instead, Jesus says to his disciples, you feed them. And they say, all we have are two fish and five loaves of bread. That's all we've got. So they're telling Jesus, no, we can't. But Jesus isn't really a we can't kind of guy. He's not going to wait for the resources to line up, for them to have everything that they need to go out into their ministry. He just says, it's enough. So Jesus blesses the food and then gives it to them and says, you feed them. He's already told them they have to feed the people. Now I tell him again, you feed them. So the disciples gather up the food that Jesus has blessed, put it into baskets, take it out to the people, and they begin feeding them. And in doing this, they feed everybody as much as anyone wants. And then there's all these baskets of food left over. This is a great miracle. And so the disciples are looking at this thinking this is the most incredible thing. And the people on the ground would wonder too, where's Jesus getting all this food from? So this is an opportunity for Jesus to do some healing. Yes, probably some teaching, but he's really showing his disciples what life in the kingdom needs to be like. How often do we in our Christian lives get all hung up waiting for things to line up for us? If we do that, it will never happen. If you're a person who thinks, you know, I feel like I'm being called to youth ministry, or I'm being called to children's ministry or adult ministry, I'm called to preach or I'm called to be an evangelist, but I can't right now because I'm waiting for this and this and this to happen. And when those things happen, then I'll do it. The Lord will never reward that. If the church thinks, you know, we really need a youth pastor, but, you know, it'd be pretty tight for us to get one, so I think we won't. You will never get a youth pastor. You will never bring those families in, and those resources will never be there. Because God doesn't reward that kind of thinking. So what does God reward? What God wants to see people do is he wants to see them acting out in faith. The kind of leadership Jesus demonstrates at the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew's Gospel is the type of faith where you lead believing that God is going to deliver. The disciples just looked at what they had in their hands and said, yeah, we can't. Jesus looked at what they had in their hands and said, oh yes, you can. We really struggle with this and we wonder how this is going to work. But it only works because the disciples took the baskets of little tiny bits of fish and bread and just started going and giving it out. If they hadn't done that, if they'd looked in the baskets at the little pieces of fish and, and little bits of bread and said, no, there isn't enough, Jesus, we can't do this, then nobody would have been fed. Instead, they needed to get out there in faith and say, we're going to make this happen. And this is what our churches need to do. This is what we need to do. If we believe we're called to a ministry, we need to get out there and make it happen. If we're waiting for things to line up for us, they never, ever will. Instead, what we need to do is align ourselves in God's purpose. We need to seek God, find out what God wants us to do, and then get out there and do it. If we're waiting around forever for the moment to be right, it's not happening. There's no right moment. God redeems bad moments. God redeems inopportune moments. God makes and creates spaces when we get out and we make a space to bring God into this is really different than our natural way of thinking. As Christian people, it's hard for us to understand how God works, how God calls us into 
his presence in the world and then expects us to do things when we don't feel like we have the tool to do that. We feel like, I don't have the resources. I don't have the faith. I can't leave town and move somewhere else because I feel like God is calling me to, to go somewhere. I can't do that. I have too many obligations. I have too much debt. I have too much money I'm making right now. I have too many relatives nearby. I can't leave. There's a million reasons we can come up with to justify not moving. But if we don't move, we will never find ourselves moving with God. God's always moving. We need to move with him. That crowd that day had no idea what was going on in the background, no doubt. And in the early church, when they looked at the kind of icons, the kind of images and pictures and poems and things that they were creating around the stories of Jesus, one of the most important ones to them was the feeding of the 5,000. Our churches have crosses in them all over the place. Orthodox churches have paintings of Mary holding little baby Jesus. There's all kinds of stuff that we have pictures of. But in the early church, two of the most powerful images that you would find all over the place would be Jesus as the Good Shepherd and the feeding of the 5,000. The people needed to know that one, God was going to care for them, two, that God means abundance, and three, there's a reason to have faith. That even when things are difficult, the Good Shepherd will be there. Even when we're seemingly starving spiritually, we want more of God and we want more of what he's doing in our lives, that God is able to provide that for us. We just need to get moving. Many churches want to grow. Many churches want their communities to thrive and prosper and be healthy. They want to see people of every generation, people of every tribe and nation, all gathered together under one roof to worship God. And this is a wonderful vision. And in order to make that happen, you have to start walking. You have to start talking. We say, Jesus, bring these people into our church. And Jesus would say the same thing he said to his disciples. You go get them. You do it. And how scary that it can be for us. You think, well, you know, Jesus, if you really want them there, you'll call them. If you really want this church full of people, no doubt you could somehow spiritually predestine them to be here. That's not what that means, and that's not how this works. If we want to see people following Jesus and experiencing his love and his grace, if we want to see people moving away from shame and into belonging, if we want to see people moving away from hurt and just dwelling on the past, moving into a forward, hopeful, future-thinking perspective where we understand God is, then we're going to have to share that with them. I don't know if you've noticed, but God doesn't typically show up uh, in weird ways other than through people. He never stops the program you're watching on television and puts a little thing on the screen for you to see. He doesn't knock on the door and, oh, there's the Holy Ghost standing there telling you what to do. That doesn't happen. What does happen is a little voice in your head, something in your heart, urging you to do something, telling you this is the right thing to do. You need to share me with them. When God trusts us to carry his message on our lips, when he trusts us to do his work with our hands, it is so vitally important that we do those things. There's two kinds of leadership that we're seeing in the gospel reading today. There's a weak leadership, the kind of leadership that looks around and all it sees is problems. And then there's the strong leadership that Jesus shows, where he looks around and he sees 15,000 plus opportunities. He could have said, you know what, I'm tired, I have nothing to give you people. Because that's the state that he was in. He had nothing left to give. He needed to be alone. The disciples looked at the food that they had in their little baskets and said, there isn't enough. We don't have anything to give. So Jesus had nothing to give, the disciples had nothing to give, and at the end of that day, filled with faith, everybody ate and people were healed. And when that was over, then Jesus went on to be alone. Then he went to pray. The gospel never leaves us where we start. If we really encounter the gospel, it means transformation in us. It means that somehow we have to learn how to accommodate other people, whether they think like us, whether they have the same dreams we do, whether they, I don't know, even want to be in the same church as us. 
that can be hard. You think, well, why don't you want to be in my church? My church is pretty good. We have a good way of looking at how God works in the kingdom of God. Why not join us? Not everyone's going to do that. The people who do come to church with us aren't going to agree on everything. The question is, can we do our best to make the place safe for other people? Can we do our best to make it so that people can thrive here? Can we do our best to help people move beyond fear into wholeness? And we can do that by being, one, safe for them, and two, filled with faith, and saying, you know what? God is for you. No one can be against you. The God who provided for the wilderness, or in the wilderness for the people of God when they were hungry, can satisfy your hunger. The God who provided the fish and the loaves for the starving people following Jesus, he can provide for you. God wants you to grow spiritually. And that means you have to eat. Eating means that you participate in the life and health of the church. And it means that you pray. It means that you read scripture. It means that you commit yourself to serving God. And serving God never means standing still. Reading is moving. Praying is moving. Reaching out to others is moving. Speaking the truth with your lips is moving. And when we move and the Spirit blesses that movement, then we will see results. Again, we go back to those churches that say, boy, it would sure be nice if we had a youth ministry and a children's ministry. And it would sure be nice to see these people in our church. And it would be great if we could do these things. And, you know, maybe someday we will. You know, maybe the time will come where we'll have the resources that are necessary to make those things a reality. When we go back to looking at that community, we can see that community will never, ever prosper. It will never be more than it is today because the people don't see the vision that God is giving them. Other churches, they grow. And they grow and they grow. We say, why? What's different with them? Why are those people so vibrant and filled with hope and love and joy and passion for their church? What's different? And the difference is they're moving. They understand they need to commit themselves first to their relationship with God, and out of that blossoms a blessing for themselves and their community. That's where we start. We don't start by looking at empty baskets and going, well, I guess we better go to town and come up with a man-made solution for this. Not in church. In church, we look at an empty basket and say, wow, God would probably really like to fill this basket. How can we do that? The challenge of our gospel today is huge. There's no limit to the challenge, and it can seem daunting. But the good news is Jesus is part of this journey. He's the one walking with us. He's the one, this miraculous hope that we have, he's the one that will fill in the baskets. He's the one that will encourage us. He's the one that will send us out. And we may go empty-handed, but we won't go empty-hearted. I spoke in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the, the Lord, Lord our God, God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. In peace we pray to you, Lord our God. for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for all those who are alone, for Devon and surrounding communities, our province, and our nation, for all our leaders, that they may work for justice, freedom, equality, and peace, for the just and respectful use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are victims of those charged with their protection. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Jane our Bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his Church. We invite your prayers for all who are ill in body, mind, and soul.
Lord, hear and have mercy. For the homeless, the poor, the isolated. Lord, hear and have mercy. The hopeless, the persecuted, the weak and the lonely. Lord, hear and have mercy. For indigenous peoples, especially those with little access to health care, safe water, medical supplies, and food, we remember our Treaty 6 neighbors. Lord, hear and have mercy. For those who are out of work or living on restricted incomes, or government help that is not equal to their normal income. For those whose businesses are in danger. Lord, hear and have mercy. For researchers studying COVID-19 and all other diseases, that they may bring relief to the suffering. Lord, hear and have mercy. For clergy, churches, and Christian communities throughout the world, that we may know how to respond to the wounds and needs of those created in the image of God. Lord, hear and have mercy. We invite your praise for all the life, strength, and health that we have. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for those ministering to the homeless, the isolated, and the poor. We whisper thanks in the public square for our families and friends. Our hearts beat with joy for the gifts you give for the treaties that allow us to inhabit this rich land. We sing your name in the fields and proclaim you on the mountains. For work done by us and others to the benefit of our community. We rejoice in the vocations you give us. For all who have recovered from COVID-19 and for all we have learned in this pandemic. We rejoice in the spark of life. For the radiant light of Christ blazing in your church throughout the world. We are grateful for your presence. For the hope we have in you, now and in the age to come. Lord, you are worthy of our thanks and praise. Help us to celebrate our progress as one people under heaven. Sharpen the memories of our past. Clarify our understanding of who we can become. Strengthen our resolve to move forward tirelessly. To build a kingdom where all your children may be healthy, prosperous and wise, safe and free. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask and are ignorant in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Your Son, Son, Jesus Christ, Christ, fed the hungry with the bread of his life and the word of his kingdom. Renew your people with your heavenly grace, and in all our weakness sustain us by your true and living bread who lives lives and and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Goodbye! Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Have a blessed week.